Hi, Pi Texas party people. I'm here to share with you automating the boring, expensive bits running Python in Lambda. My name is Ryan Hillard, and I am a systems developer at the US Small Business Administration. And I am also a baby Python. Uh, and by that, I mean the program I'm about to share with you today is actually my first Python program ever uh, to run in a production environment. So the talk today is actually about compliance and automating compliance. And I know when I bring this up, uh, the word kind of falls apart like this. I imagine that most people feel like the E, their head hits the table and they don't want to think too hard about compliance. Uh, but I promise this talk's going to be fun and interesting. So stick with me. So to start from the beginning, there is a law called the Federal Information Security Management Act or FISMA. And that law does a lot of things for the federal government, but one of the things it does is mandate that the heads of agencies or CIOs need to track their information systems by creating an inventory or a kind of list of digital assets that exist. Now, that law was originally written in 2002 and as you might imagine, back then, an inventory looked a little bit differently than it does today. Um, I like to think that there was a wooden abacus back then, and uh, different parts of it represented uh, maybe networks, servers living in those networks, and maybe even storage or disks on those servers. And, you know, all of that actually got collated and collected in Excel, of course, where we tracked it manually. And that was fine, actually. That actually worked back in 2002, and it worked well. But the reason it worked is because we thought of our digital assets as pets. And like this pack of dogs, which are defined by the leashes here, um, I like to think of this as a, a network. And uh, each one of these leashes might be an open port. And inside of that network, each dog, uh, we can think of as being like a server. Uh, so here's Bella, here's Charlie. Uh, and then of course, here's adorable Daisy. And the reason why we think of, uh, we used to at least think of these as pets is because if Daisy, for example, got sick, uh, then we would take care of Daisy like she was a pet. And, Daisy would live in the same IP space and she would consume the same resources and you know, we, we would make sure she was well taken care of. Now, like I said, that worked for a long time until the cloud came along. And you've, you know, you've heard this story before, the cloud has changed everything. Um, but one of the things that it changed fundamentally was how we think about digital infrastructure. We stopped, started to think, we stopped thinking about it like pets, and we started thinking about servers more like cattle. So imagine you have a field full of cattle, and they're defined by a network. They're living in a pasture, which is a network, uh, and each one represents a different server, the different uh, IP address. And, uh, but in the cloud, when one of these gets sick, like the second web server here, um, we don't we don't treat it like it was Daisy. We don't log into it uh, and try and revive it. it. Let's say it ran out of memory or something. Uh, we actually, we find a new one, a new VM, and we, we kill that old one. We kind of send it off to be hamburger. And uh, one of the things that's problematic about that is that new server that we just brought in, um, we're just going to, we're going to filter it back in and it's going to consume the same IP space. Well, that's a problem because if you were used to kind of counting these things with an abacus, then um, you, you now have like one bead that looks like two beads uh, and it's very confusing. So the second problem is in the cloud, we have this concept of auto scaling groups. So going back to our cows, if we've got our, our kind of regular load on the system happening, and then all of a sudden we get a, just a rush of traffic, um, we have an auto scaling group that says, okay, call in more cows. Like, we need to deal with this traffic. Uh, let's get more servers in the mix. Uh, since that happens automatically, uh, 
that's a real, that's another kind of big problem for system inventories because all of a sudden the system is grown in a dimension that the inventory didn't account for before. Imagine also that uh, afterwards that system can shrink, right? It's like truly elastic. Maybe it's even a dev environment and good development environments, at least in cloud, uh, in the cloud world, should get shut down on, on the weekends and evenings. So maybe there's an empty network there. In this case, the inventory you have doesn't actually represent real life and that's a big problem. And then finally, there's a size problem. So when we're running in a cloud environment, of course, you know, we've got the network, here's our pasture, but look at this. There are a lot of other networks out there and we can kind of send cattle out, spin up servers in all of these different places, uh, kind of willy nilly as we, as we want to. So to some, there are kind of three problems with that old way of tracking system inventories. We're dealing at a larger scale right now. Um, there's a, there's a fundamentally different paradigm. When one server goes bad, we, we kind of destroy it and replace it with a fresh one. We don't worry about uh, fixing it. And then uh, it's actually a fluid system, right? It grows and it shrinks. And so that inventory has to be able to account for those things uh, in, in better time than it used to. So my friend Darren Wigfield, uh, he is an information system security officer or one of the folks that's in charge of making sure these inventories are correct. He and I collaborated on this project and I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge his incredible efforts. Uh, he also said I could absolutely call him a bean counter. So he's also the bean counter in this world. Um, and I, you know, Darren is the kind of the, the business side of it and I'm, I'm the development side of it, and, but bringing it together, uh, I'm gonna tell you about how we offered the organization a lot of value. So Darren and I sat down and in order to assess whether or not this project was worth doing, we did some kind of back of the napkin math here and we figured out that it would take about 12 hours, we thought to solve the problem and we thought that information security officers were spending about an hour a week generating a weekly inventory, uh, if they even did that. So in three months, 12 hours, we would make up the difference, uh, assuming there was just one of these. So we're going to do the project, basically. So we selected a tool. Now let's talk a little bit about why. So why AWS Lambda? Well, for us, we didn't want to add a piece of automation that incurred more maintenance. So uh, we don't have to worry about a server here. That was a huge plus. Lambda is a function as a service offering, meaning it's a tiny little runtime that somebody else maintains for you. You just give it code and it runs that code. Pretty cool. So there's nothing to really patch. We have a big patching problem in, in large enterprises. And you know, that's reflected by uh, all the data leaks and all of the issues that uh, you, know, you see in the news. We didn't want to add to our patching problem by having another server we have to maintain. And then like, once again, I just want to say there's no runtime maintenance. That's really great. That's the huge appeal of Lambda to me. And of course, a bonus is that it's extremely affordable. And then I just want to pause here and like refer to Dan McKinley, who has this great quote. How would we solve the problem at hand without adding anything new? Uh, you know, newness, uh, sprawling technology is not without expense. Uh, and I think Dan's really onto something here. So the kind of cherry on top for Lambda for us is we already have access to it. It's a part of our infrastructure. Because we're running everything in AWS, uh, Lambda is there waiting for us. And then the final little thing I wanted to mention is Lambda is so small and efficient that running a single one is very energy efficient and that's good for the earth and that's good for us. All right, so why Python? I probably don't have to convince PyTexas on this, but I'm gonna try anyways. Um, we really were uh, interested in Python because of the imperative coding style that it uh, conferred. Also, uh, you know, Stack Overflow survey, uh, can't go wrong with this. Python is always in the second or third most loved language. And, uh, you know, the, kind of taking a step back again to some external wisdom here from Mr. Kinsella. Um, 
Python was really interesting to us because we didn't have to worry about a bunch of dependencies, right? Um, the appeal of having a robust standard library running in this little remote runtime uh, was huge because we don't have to think about uh, you know breaking independency or patching independency or anything like that. And then of course, uh, everyone knows Python is hugely popular, but I didn't realize this until I went and checked the Stack Overflow survey for 2020. And it's actually almost, uh, you know, almost doubles its lead over JavaScript and Go uh, as being the most wanted technology by professional developers. And that's really cool. And I think it says that Python's just gonna keep growing and growing and growing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the architecture of our solution. I wanted to lay out the whole picture before we get into the nitty gritty. So CloudWatch is an AWS service that allows you to define events. In this case, we're defining a time-based event. By that, we mean we want something to happen every so often, so every week, let's say. And uh, that thing we want to happen is we want our Lambda to run. Our Lambda is written in all Python, and the Python code is saying, hey, go out, scan these cloud assets, put together an inventory for me. So do what that abacus uh, used to be uh, done manually by someone, uh, put it in the CSV. So put it in the format that I'm used to, and then go save it in object storage. So save it in S3. Uh, and this part's important because we want some element of permanence to it. So this is our high level architecture. We're gonna step through each of the steps now. All right, so uh, going into step number one, one of the things that's important to understand about AWS is that when you want to access resources in a different account, um, we have our systems defined in different accounts, um, you have to assume cross account access. And basically what that means is you are you have an agreement with a foreign entity that you're both allowed to talk to each other. And so what's happening here is we are using Boto3, which is the AWS SDK for Python. And we're using that to create a resource and we're calling the STS service or the security token service. And we're saying, hey, get, you know, give it, let, allow us to assume a role in the second account, account B. And we're going to assume the role of CA-scanner, which just stands for cross-account scanner. And it's going to return to us some credentials, some temporary credentials, so we can actually do our work. So this is what we just described in architectural format. We're calling out with our Lambda to STS that security service is allowing us to assume a role and the account and the security service are returning to us credentials so we can actually do work. So I'll, I just wanna pause here and explain some things I discovered about Boto3, uh, the, the SDK. So clients versus resources. Clients are low level interfaces, meaning you're really close to the actual AWS service API. Uh, whereas resources, resources are really nice. They're object oriented interfaces, meaning they come with uh, kind of easy ways to deal with it. And what I found through this process is that I, I would be excited when I would discover that a service had a resource to offer through the SDK. And then I would kind of pr mentally prepare myself if I was stuck uh, dealing with a low level client. And I'll, I'll show you a couple examples of that as we go through the code. So now that we've got those credentials, we're basically going to create either a resource or a client for each different service that we wanna go through and scan. So here, and we'll, we'll go through these individually, but we're basically, we're looking at different uh, services like EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, which is virtual machines, or RDS, which is the relational database service. So that's uh, for databases, for storage. Uh, or things like Elasticash, API Gateway, uh, you, you probably know what those two do. Uh, so after that, uh, let's look at one specific example. So one of the ways that we quantify our inventories is in devices. So we define a new array and that array, uh, because this is a resource, 
we're actually going to be able to iterate through it using ec2.instances.all, uh, which is just super easy and nice and uh, you know preferable. But one of the things I immediately found out upon doing this project, like almost on in the first hour, is that we actually had an old server running on one of the accounts I was testing against that had an image that was so old, it was in the wrong format and this API call would uh, kind of choke and fail. So from like hour number one, this little automation project showed some value because we didn't realize we had that old server and we needed to like go kill it. Uh, so after writing a guard clause here to make sure that this uh, API call didn't fail, uh, we move on to pulling out the tag names and also the environment details. And then from here, uh, because this is a resource, this is really nice. We have access to all of these things where you can go in and just map from kind of human readable column, uh, like host name or private IP or baseline image, and we can pull that off of the API itself. So uh, let's look at the next one. So this is another device, a load balancer, but this is using a client. And you can see here that uh, I'm having to do a little bit more work to actually pull the information I want out. I'm having to understand from this lower level client exactly what's going on in the data. So this is just something to be aware of. All right. so. Uh, those were our two device examples. The other way we think about systems are in interfaces. So a VPC is a virtual private cloud or a network. And what's nice about this and what's kind of interesting about this is as I dug into this, I started to learn a little bit more about how AWS actually works. And by that, I mean VPCs are actually just kind of a subcomponent of the EC2 service. So you can see here, I'm still benefiting from using that EC2 resource. I can still use a kind of dot all and iterate over that with a for loop. Um, so this is kind of an, in another easy one. It's not like dealing with a client, but it's very telling that VPCs are part of the EC2 service. And it allows us to kind of like trace back some of AWS's DNA to figure out that EC2 is like one of the core services and one of the first ones. Uh, you can't run much without a network. So uh, VPCs are, are a, a starting point. And then of course, I just wanted to call out that there are a lot of fields here that are left uh, NA and uh, those are future opportunities for improvement. We hope to do a lot with those. All right, so uh, moving on to a different interface. So this is RDS, this is a managed database service. And looking at this, you can see that uh, I left a little note here. This isn't super useful right now uh, because they're one of the difficulties that we had before when we were kind of using the old abacus method was uh, certain data fields didn't really map over. We didn't have a, for example, in this case, we didn't have like a discrete name like Daisy for our database. Instead, we were using a database identifier and that's what actually made it unique. Um, and so we had to kind of figure out how that worked. The other thing I did here is I started to have a conversation with Darren, the security officer I was working with on this project. I started to notice data points that I thought the security team might be interested in, like, uh, is it encrypted or what's the backup period? And so we actually ended up adding more fields to the inventory process than we had originally planned so that we can improve our security. And I think that's really cool. So that's number two, that's step number two. If step number one was assuming that uh, identity, step number two is actually scanning the resources and iterating through them and putting them into a human readable format. So let's talk about step number three. So once we've got all the data, now we can bring it all together and we're going to actually just use a very simple function here to uh, kind of write out a dictionary in CSV format, specifying the columns. Uh, and then we're gonna do something interesting. We're gonna store it in local file storage for a second. One of the interest, uh, kind of one of the nice things about Lambda is you have a 
access to a file system, but it's ephemeral. So once the Lambda is done executing, it's gonna go away, which is fine because we're composing a CSV, but we want it to live on. So in this case, uh, we're actually outputting it to uh, the simple storage service or S3, which is object storage uh, at a certain ID uh, with a certain Unix timestamp attached to it. Now, one of the final things that I, I would be remiss if I didn't share with you is, remember, Lambda is a function as a service offering, meaning it's expecting something to return. It's a function. So even though this, this thing is all done, it's done all of its work, if you don't return some status code uh, saying you did work and you're successful, uh, your, your Lambda will be mad at you. So in this case, we're just saying, hey, dump this to the logs, let them know that we were successful. So that's number three, taking the data that we combed and turning it into something that we can use uh, forevermore. Okay, so let's bring it all together and actually automate it by uh, making it happen on a certain schedule. So this is a picture of the Lambda console. On the left side, there's uh, the CloudWatch event trigger I was talking about. And if you were to click that add trigger button, it would give you an interface where you can define a cron job. So you can go in and say, hey, I want this thing to run on certain days of the week at a certain time. In this case, it's Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern for us. And then you can also feed it an account number. So at the very beginning of our function, we were pulling an account out of the event object. And that's because uh, we want to know which system we're going to scan. This is where you would enter those details in your trigger. As you can see, we had kind of nine initial ones set up, and those were all set to run and scan different systems and bring back inventories. So this is the final step. This is taking that CloudWatch event, hooking it up to the Lambda, which was kind of step number one. We kind of did backwards forwards um, and making the whole system work. So here's the actual output. Uh, the output looks like this. It's a series of files in CSV format where we capture the artifacts, the devices, and the interfaces. And we get a weekly one. And then if we were to open devices and interfaces, you can see that we're getting human readable information in a, in a very like uh, easy to consume and predictable way. And we're getting the same thing every week. And by doing that, we're getting to see how systems change over time. So the feedback we've gotten is very success, uh, you know, very positive, uh, and we're pretty excited about the results of this. So by the numbers, it's a very small program, 626 lines of code, only four kilobytes, um, and, uh, but it's doing a lot of work. So in terms of cost savings, uh, it, you know, at one hour per system per week, uh, we use a blended rate of about $80 per hour per worker. Uh, and at 21 current accounts in AWS, each one needs to be inventoried. We're talking about, uh, you know, about $1,700 a week in terms of savings and about $90,000 per year, which is pretty amazing. Now, I would, you know, I feel bad if I didn't stop here and, and acknowledge something, which is that uh, CFOs and budget people, they don't actually think that this is real cost savings. And that's because, um, you know, we, that person's still employed. We're still paying them $80 an hour. And while someone with a, you know, uh, an accountant might be suspicious of me calling this cost savings, I actually think uh, the benefits are bigger than cost savings because what you're regaining is actually the opportunity to do something else. So those people don't have to think about compliance like this anymore, like we did at the beginning with the Eve, you know, flat on the, on the table. Um, that guy instead uh, feels more like this. He's super happy, right? And he's super happy because automation means happiness. He no longer has to do mundane menial tasks like count digital assets. Uh, instead, he can focus his energy elsewhere. So 
In conclusion, Python running in Lambda, I think it's the ultimate cloud cron job runner. I've only written a couple of these so far, um, but I'm really amped about it and I've, I've had great results so far. I, I want to share with you the, some future improvements. We plan on uh, making some of the output easier to read, uh, kind of enhancing it. And then we're also going to expand this script to additional AWS services. Uh, all of this code is going to be open source by the time you see this video, and you can find it at our organization, which is slash USSBA on GitHub. So I have a call to action for you all. Um, find a problem, do some napkin math to see if it's worth automating. Select a tool, just go do it. I'll leave you with a quote from a good friend of mine, Mr. John King which is what's the actual lifetime of the decision you're making? Are you sitting there and are you over analyzing what's going on? Are you thinking for four hours about a piece of work that's only going to take you two? Just go do it, go automate the thing. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great PyTexas.